Hello, everybody. So today we're very honored to have a distinguished visitor, uh, Yuri Gurevich. Uh, Yuri uh, has a distinguished academic career, serving on the faculty of universities of Sverdlovsk, uh, Tbilisi, uh, Bersheva, and uh, more recently, uh, Michigan at Ann Arbor. Uh, he is currently a principal researcher at uh, Microsoft Research in Redmond, Washington. And I understand that his uh, uh, current area is uh, access authorization languages, which is something relevant to like public health systems. Uh, I ran searches uh, about Yuri on Google, which returned 21,700 results. On Yahoo, 94,400 results. And on Bing, 30,400 results, which is any number you take is impressive. Uh, Yuri published more than 200 uh, papers. The reason I know 200 because on his uh, homepage there are at least 200 references with uh, free access uh, to the PDF papers. Uh, today he's going to be speaking not about access authorization though, but about the church Turing thesis, story and recent progress. Yuri, welcome. Thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation. So that's the agenda, prehistory of the thesis, the story itself, critique, and then at the end, hopefully I have time, recent uh, developments, the main point of which is that uh, we were able to derive thesis from first principles. Okay, now to prehistory. So I could have beginning, could have start from you know ancient Greece, but let's start from George Bull, um, who formalized propositional logic. He was speaking about the laws of thought. Then a German logician. Frege tried to do a similar task, but much more challenging. Thank you. A much more challenging task to formalize predicate logic. And uh, he published, he worked very hard, published books. And then one day, this particular day, June 16 of 1902, here is. Um, Bertrand Russell sends him a letter, a very short letter. It starts, um, dear Herr Professor um, Frege, I'm uh, like your, your work, a couple of pleasantries. And so, then he says, well, there is this a little bit of a problem. And here is the problem. So let's define a collection of set, I call it R in honor of Russell. Um, an arbitrary set S belongs to R if and only if S does not contain itself. Oops. <laughs> okay, this is logic. And this second R. Syntax is R, but semantics is S. <laughs> In any case, S belongs to R if and only if S does not belong to S. Okay. Now, you may say, no set contains itself. That's fine. Now we substitute R for S, and we get R belongs to R if and only if R does not belong to R. It is common to call it politely paradox, but it is a blatant contradiction within the formal system of Frege. As far as I know, Frege never published another line. Now, Russell himself, together with Alfred 
Whitehead proceeded with a similar attempt. And in 1910, 1913, they published three volumes of one of the most famous and most boring <laughs> books in, of 20th century. So th the idea was you take uh, particular pure logic, axioms, and rule of inference, and the ambition is to derive all mathematical truths from, from in that system. And it was enormous work. They wanted to publish yet another volume, but, but were just exhausted. And it takes just a lot, a lot of work just to, to keep the machine going. So the theorem that 1 plus 1 equals 2 appears in the second volume, formulated, and proved in the third one. <laughs> Nevertheless, for experts, seemed obvious that what they're doing is doable. So they formalized much of um, arithmetic and some other parts of math. They wanted to do more. But it was clear to experts that you can go on and formalize more and more. They avoided paradoxes like the one I showed you, Russell's paradox. There was a number of other paradoxes of that sort unknown. They avoided them using type theory. It is that same type theory that today used in programming uh, theory, in programming languages. That's the origin of it. So in the bottom, there was first order logic, where you speak about elements which by themselves are not sets, you know, like people in this room. On the second level was lo second order logic, where you could speak about sets of elements. On the third level was third order logic, where you could speak about sets of sets of elements, and so on. Even though people were more or less convinced that mathematics can be derived there, the question remains. Can it? Can you derive all mathematical proofs within Principia? And then Kurt Gödel burst, bursts into, into the scene, the greatest logician of 20th century. In 1929 paper, he showed that as far as first order logic is concerned, whatever mathematical truth can be expressed can be proven. So any statement in first order logic which is true is also provable. A couple of years later, he published his most famous result that this is not true for Principia, and in fact for any other sufficiently rich logic system. For any such logic system, there are sentences which are obviously true and yet unprovable. So this, this second result is the most famous. And one can speak about it for a long time, but it would be a different lecture. The first result is more relevant to our story. So earlier, in 1928, David Hilbert, speaking on, an intern on one of the congresses of mathematicians, posed the following problem. Okay. He says, OK, take a formal system like Principia or first order logic. Um, every statement is presumably true or false. Can you find an algorithm? Or, oh, sorry, not can. Find an algorithm. <laughs> which establishes which is it. Is the given sentence true or false? The Gödel, Gödel's 1931st result showed that certainly you cannot do it for Principia or any other large uh, rich system 
because the truths are not even provable there. But for the first order logic, the question sounds very meaningful. You know, all true things are provable. And so the question becomes very well posed. I give you a sentence in first order logic. Is it provable or not? And it is that question that caught the attention of Alonzo Church and Alan Turing. And that's the end of prehistory and the beginning of our story. <laughs> so, so in, Church was fascinated, fascinated by lambda notation. I think you all know what lambda notation is. Here is a simple example. So suppose you write a plus x squared. Okay. The intention is that x is variable and a is a constant. But you know, when you deal with mathematicians, you never know. A seems to be a constant. Next thing he will take, to, to, will uh, take a derivative over a. So how to indicate that, yes, a is constant and x is variable? And that's what there's lambda for. You say lambda x, and that shows that lambda is considered to be variable. So in this case, a plus x, lambda x, a plus x squared is a function of x. If you substitute two, two you get a plus 4. So Church's ambition was to develop foundations of mathematics on, on that lambda notation. So by that, by that time, the most standard uh, foundational system was set theory. And he wanted that notion of a function rather than a set would be the basis for foundations. So he developed a formal system, and he had two very good students. Stephen Kleene and Barclay Rosser, who became quite well-known logicians in their own right. And there was a bit of a danger of having such good students. He asked them to work on his system, and they demolished it. <laughs> they proved that the system is contradictory. But contrary to Frege, Church took it in stride, and and proceeded to define a fragment of that system, which became known as lambda calculus. And probably many of you who came from more theoretical background well familiar with it. So Church is considered to be kind of the father of this lambda calculus. And in this lambda calculus, he restricted attention to natural numbers, non-negative integers. And this lambda calculus can be seen as a kind of high-level programming language for programming um, numerical functions. By numerical function, I will mean a function from natural numbers to natural numbers. By 1934, Church arrives to a conjecture that any Function, numerical function, that it's computable, sort of, as they used to say at the time, mechanically, without using your creativity. In other words, if there is an algorithm for computing this function, for any such function, there is a, it can be programmed in lambda calculus. Kurt Gödel, who is Austrian, happens to visit Princeton Princeton Institute for Advanced Studies during 1933-34 academic year. And he didn't like the idea at all. He found it uh, thoroughly unsatisfactory. <laughs> uh, a flashback. Earlier, Hilbert was interested in functions which at the time were called recursive. Now they're called primitive recursive. So here's an example. You can quickly guess what function is it. And uh, so that kind of recursion. And Hilbert was interested whether this is the most general recursion or not. 
he had good students of his own, Wilhelm Ackermann and Rosa Petter, and many others, but these particular two students worked on that problem, and they both showed that the answer is no. There are more sophisticated recursions, which are not primitive recursions. So in spring of 1934, Gödel gave a series of lectures at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. And he mentions that it seems to be the case that an arbitrary computable numerical function can be given by some kind of recursion. Not necessarily primitive recursion, more general. Now the question arose, can you define you know, the most general recursion? And um, he made an attempt. He presented a recursive calculus for that purpose. And he said, the fact that every such function can be expressed in this calculus cannot possibly be proven, because the notion of computability is informal. You, know, you can prove equivalence between two mathematical notions, but you cannot, because all the proofs belong to the mathematical world. You cannot prove equivalence of a mathematical notion to something informal. I just wanted to say also a word that sometimes visiting researchers are useful. We have some number of them at <laughs> Microsoft Research, and certainly I always argue that visiting researchers is a good thing. Church and Kliny establish that lambda calculus and uh, Gödel's recursive calculus or recursion calculus are, in a sense, equivalent. So any program, take any program of a numerical function in one of the calculi, and you can translate it systematically. And there is a systematic translation which will translate any such program to a program in the other calculi. Church conjectures that every computable numerical function is expressible in Gödel's recursion calculus, which equivalent to his previous conjectures is expressible in his lambda calculus. Gödel is unconvinced. Churches go on and publishes his conjecture. And coming back to Hilbert's problem, derives now, using this conjecture, now the notion of computable becomes formalized, because instead of just vaguely vague notion of being computable by some mechanical means, there is a very precise notion, big, having a program in Gödel's recursion calculus, or in, lambda, or in lambda calculus. And from this conjecture, which eventually became known as the thesis, Church's thesis, he derives negative answer to Hilbert's question. There is no algorithm which, given arbitrary first order sentence, uh, would check is it provable or not. It's a good thing for mathematicians because a lot of mathematical statements, very meaningful, like Riemann conjecture, can be expressed in first order logic. And then there was Turing. He was sitting quietly <laughs> in England and working on his idea. So what Turing did, he analyzed computation. So at the time, the computer was, as Turing said, a man. The man computes. And Turing said, OK, suppose we have a, a numerical function which is computable. So let's have a look how does the computer compute it. So he writes on a paper without loss of generality. The paper is like children's arithmetical paper you know, in squares. 
without loss of generality, he writes one character per square. Without loss of generality, there are only so many characters, because otherwise, he says, he will be confused. And after so many, uh, after without loss of generality, uh, such clauses, he arrives to a machine, which is now known as the Turing machine. And that is a very, very convincing argument. He also uh, has a conjecture which is now called Turing's thesis, that every numerical function can be programmable uh, in Turing machines. And he also derives from this conjecture the negative answer to Hilbert's question. As he's going to publish his paper, he learns that Church already published the Church's thesis a bit earlier. So he quickly proves in the appendix that the two theses are equivalent. So if you accept one, you can prove the other. Church was a gentleman. <laughs> He published a review of Turing's paper in Journal of Symbolic Logic, and it starts from clear statement, this is an independent work, because he was there first. <laughs> then he compares and he acknowledges that uh, Turing's argument is more convincing. In fact, it was so convincing that the great skeptic, the most skeptical of them all, Kurt Gödel, accepted uh, Turing's argument. Uh, nobody was as skeptical as Gödel. <laughs> In fact, later on, he changed his mind, but that's again a different story <laughs> on he being uh, Gödel. Now a bit of a critique. So in the meantime, Church Turing's thesis, since they're equivalent for our purposes, it's sort of one thesis, became so well accepted, not many people doubt it. But why people believe it? So of course, most people believe because other people believe. Nothing wrong with it. You, know, you can't require everybody to start to rethink all the foundations. In fact, it's, it's good. It means that uh, people do trust foundations. <laughs> but if you do dig into it, what arguments are there? So one argument which is often given, that there are so many different computation models that are equivalent. So I mentioned lambda calculus and uh, uh, Gödel's recursion calculus and Turing machines. But very quickly, there are many, many models and they all have proven to be equivalent. Another argument is that you know, there's so many years of experience from 1936. And then there was analysis of, of Turing and one other analysis. So let me examine these arguments one by one. So many different computation models are equivalent. There is a problem with this argument and uh, People saw it right away. Um, the problem is that what does it prove? What it really proves that the notion is robust. It does not necessarily prove that it is right. Think of uh, Newtonian physics, which for centuries thought to be right. It turns out to be it's not exactly right. Besides, even though there are so many computation models which are equivalent, only those initial models were independent. Wasn't post-war independent? Too? No. It was almost immediate, but he saw Church's paper. All right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Post actually came with a very beautiful model. And what today it's 
often taught as um, called Turing machines, it's much closer to Post machines. <laughs> yes. But it was not independent. Yeah. So many years of experience. Let's see how strong this argument is. Imagine you live in a flat country, <laughs> like Holland or whatever, you know, Bangladesh, you know, what, what other uh, flat countries are there. And you measure, um, you know, temper boiling temperature of the water, you know, day after day, year after year, and it's always 100 degrees Celsius. And then you happen to, to visit you know, California and go to Mount Shasta, and you discover that, wait, it's not quite 100 degrees. So just a lot of experience shows nothing. You have to actively and creatively challenge. There have not been many challenges to the thesis. Finally, the analysis. So what we really have, the most, the, the single, on almost exclusive argument for the thesis is Turing's initial uh, argumentation. So if you haven't read, I, I envy you. It's a very beautiful piece of a kind of speculative philosophy. It's extremely convincing. I know only one attempt, somewhat implicit, in 1950s, Kolmogorov, with a student of his, Vladimir Uspensky, uh, published an, a model which is called Kolmogorov machines. Actually, we have here one fellow who worked on these machines <laughs> for a while. Um, and it seems one of Kolmogorov's students, who is friend of mine, uh, Leonid Levin, he's a professor at Boston University, tells me, not from this paper, but from his personal conversations with Kolmogorov, that it seems that um, Kolmogorov had in mind an alternative analysis of computation. Instead of analyzing a man computing, or a woman <laughs> person computing uh, something, he analyzed computation as a physical process, proceeding in time and space. And you know, if you have some bit in, in its immediate vicinity can be only so many other bits. But there is none of that in, uh, in the paper itself. Also, it's easy to check that Kolmogorov machine does not reflect three-dimensional or four-dimensional or any finite dimensional geometry. So if, as a practical matter, it should work in some uh, if you believe in many dimensions in uh, brain, uh, theory of brains of uh, modern physics, uh, so maybe he's right. <laughs> in any case, one interesting question arises, which Gödel's pointed out, and it is this, that if you look at uh, Turing's analysis, and if you try to imagine Kolmogorov's analysis, one problem that arises, can you pin sort of squeeze it to f few simple principles from which you can derive the thesis? And many people tried, it is hard. For example, Turing writes about uh, the computer, this man, having only finite number states of mind. The idea is that you have only finite number state of mind as a computer. Because as you compute, you may stop and go for lunch. You can leave some notes, and some other person can come back and proceed with your computation. Okay. So that, uh, um, for those of you who remember Turing machines, that gave rise to the finite number of state of control of a Turing machine. But it's hard to, to formulate this as a, math as a mathematical statement. In any case, Gödel had uh, 
um, uh, said this, that it might be possible to state a set of axioms which would embody the generally accepted properties of computability and to do something on this basis. In other words, maybe you can come up with a s relatively simple sort of first principles and to derive the thesis from those first principles. It's impossible to prove the thesis from scratch because the thesis equates a formal and informal notion. But what we can do, we can minimize this, uh, the, the gap and we can f formulate what we want to uh, say about the f informal part as, a, as few as possible, as simple as possible principles and then to derive the thesis from those principles. OK, now I'm coming to recent developments. And there will be two parts. In the first part will be the analysis of sequential algorithms. And in the second part will be our attempt to, to perform what that Gödel's program analysis. That's not Church, not Turing. Not Gödel, but uh, yours truly. So some serious books define algorithm as Turing machines. So Turing succeeded wildly. <laughs> now, that is incorrect. There is much more to an algorithm than a function it computes. So it is true. Sorry, what's the, the thesis says, take any computable numerical function. There is a Turing machine which computes that same function. But Turing never said that if you have an algorithm, that the Turing machine will be just, just like that algorithm. Because you know, there's a lot in the algorithm which Turing machine will, will not capture idea, levels of, uh, a level of abstraction, data structures, complexity, and, and so on and so forth. So in fact, Turing machine is a very, very low level language. So let me give you a very trivial example when you see how things just lose any individuality when, when they compile to Turing machine. So uh, recall um, Euclidean algorithm for computing the greatest common divisor. And there are two versions which are popular. In one version, uh, you use difference. In another version, you use division. Now, they are different, so typic typically considered different algorithms. But suppose you compile them both to Turing machines. So in particular, you have somehow to implement division. How will you implement division? probably as a diff by differences. And so the distinction between the algorithm will be raised. Besides, typical algorithms is presumed to, you know, to, f to finish, to terminate and produce the result. There are very good algorithms which don't produce, don't terminate, you know, say, uh, an operating system. It's I don't know what operating system you use, <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yes, I expected this <laughs> at that point. <laughs> yes. Well, rarely terminates these days. <laughs> OK, and, but the principal point, it's one of useful algorithms that you don't want to terminate. <laughs> and surely the. Turing machine implementation of such algorithm is it's inadequate. Now, at the time that Church and Turing worked, uh, children. <laughs> We're disagreeing with you. Not quite. <laughs> we just want to see public about it. Okay. By the way, this is uh, Von Pratt, author of many famous algorithms. 
Not the Euclidean algorithm. <laughs> He's not that young. <laughs> okay. So at the time that uh, Church and Turing worked, or Kolmogorov for that matter, in 1950s, uh, the notion of algorithms was much simpler. <laughs> Later on came, you know, parallel and concurrent algorithms and real-time algorithms and whatnot. So here we restrict attention to those algorithms which um, I'll call them sequential. So in, in his analysis, Kolmogorov said it quite succinctly what those algorithms are. An algorithm, he said, computes in steps of bounded complexity. Steps of, it's not the number of steps which typical in uh, time complexity. It's the, the, the single step has bounded complexity. So here, here will be our running example. So you have a continuous function f on a fixed interval between a and b. And f of a is less than f of b, and there is some zero in between. And so we want to find uh, the, uh, the value of the argument, with, which it, we want to find the zero of that function, let's say, with precision epsilon. To find a point uh, x such that f of x is uh, less than epsilon by absolute value. And this is uh, quite an obvious algorithm. So you just uh, half, or you dice, uh, bisect, take uh, a, um, half the interval a, b, and see what happens in this point. If, so in, on, on this picture, you do one step, and at the division point, let me see. Step one, at the division point, we have f is positive. So we redefine b. We have new b prime. Then we do another step. This time, in the midpoint, it's negative. We redefine a, and so on. You go until you become close enough to the 0. So here is the program, a program. Ah, I'll say I did, I'll say in which language it is <laughs> a bit later. So when I came from mathematics to computer science in 1980s, um, so I wasn't, I wasn't 18 already then, <laughs> and I was thinking, what is computer science about? And and I came to the conclusion that it's all about algorithms. You know, operating systems, compilers, databases, they all are algorithms. So the interesting question, what's an algorithm? You know, if you go to physics, physicists study all kind of stuff in the world. But if you look at mathematically, it's partial differential equations. So mathematically, the language of physics is PDEs. So in that sense, what would be the sort of the PDEs of computer science? Now, Turing machines naturally come to mind, but they are, with all respect to great Alan Turing, <laughs> uh, too clumsy, too low level. And so the one possible thought, can one came up with sort of generalization of Turing machine with a machine model which is so versatile that for any other sequential algorithm, there exists a machine in our class which will simulate the algorithm step for step. And the first impression, at least of mine, was surely not. But suppose you have such a machine. How would it look like? By the way, the, the picture is from Spain. Taken, <laughs> taken by the lady, which is, happened to be my wife, sitting. 
<laughs> there, okay, the wrong way. So this analysis led to the notion of abstract state machines. Um, and there was a use for such machines, such versatile machines, namely for writing high-level specifications. That was attracted attention of Microsoft research, and that's how I moved from academia to, to Microsoft. Later, already at Microsoft, uh, without too much teaching, having some more time on my hands, I was able to write down three axioms which attempt to formalize the notion of um, sequential algorithms. One of them is sequential time, another is abstract state, and the third one, bounded exploration. So I'll quickly describe them. The first one is completely obvious. You have a sequential algorithm. It's, it's compute step after step. So, so an algorithm or sequential algorithm is a transition system, which is completely determined by the states and the transition functions. So there are only two questions remain, just two little questions. What are the states and what, what are the transition functions? Which reminds me a saying of uh, Knuth. He, asked, he said that there are two great problems in the I. What is A and what is I? States. What are the states? So sometimes in uh, programming textbooks, they would tell you that state is given by the values of the variables. And this is not true. So imagine you have, say, a C program and say three variables x, y, z, and you know the values of x, y, z. Do you know the state? Not necessarily, because you have to know where you are in the program. And if the program has you know, recursive functions, then now recursive in the sense of programming, then you have stack with uh, various unfinished computations there. So the, the programming language creates an illusion of simplicity. You just deal with, with variables. But the true state is much more complicated. So at least if you, if you define, if you agree with my definition of state. So by state, I mean information which completely determines the future computation or computations um, given the program. So the second postulate, probably the most critical, says that states are what logicians called structures, or algebraists call algebras. So it's a set with uh, functions and relations over it. The most technical is the third postulate. And this was my attempt to solve question implicitly posed by Kalmogorov. He spoke, he said, algorithms compute by, ste by steps of bounded complexity. So what, what does it mean? So here's an attempt to answer um, what bounded complexity is. So imagine you have a program. Uh, and you work with such states as, as I defined, uh, where everything is explicit. So where everything is truly given by, by the values of the variables. Now, those variables may, may be, fun be functions or relations. Now, imagine you want to say, uh, show me that element. No, the important part of the abstract state, that the state is the structure determined up to isomorphism. So the only information you have about states, you know, what are the constants, what are the functions, what are the relations, 
nothing else. You know, if you know Lisp, they, they start it very cleanly, and then they have this quote. And they say, OK, this atom is you know, represented by number 17. Now, we don't allow this. So the, and the only way to indicate element is just to give an expression that evaluates to that element. So that's the motivation for this postulate. So there are expressions which depends on the program, but not on the state or input. And those programs, those expressions or terms, uh, called critical terms, they determine the state change in the following sense. That if I have two states where these critical terms give the same values, otherwise the, the states may be vastly different, <laughs> then the delta will be the same in both cases. The state change will be the same. Now, I cannot uh, dwell on it too long as I have to move. But now, given these three postulates, we can give a definition. Our definition, an algorithm is an abstract state, bounded exploration, transition system. So the bounded exploration, the, the name uh, reflects this idea that all what the algorithm explores during the state are these critical terms. So it's a, it's a bounded uh, thing. Now, these are three of the four eventual first principles from which we will derive the thesis. <laughs> So, uh, you know, this is not religion. We put those principles on the table, and they can be argued. But one also can, can ask, say, uh, for the formalization of sequential algorithms, you have three postulates. Maybe you need you know, seven more. I know that I don't need more but because I have a representation theory. So if I take any algorithm in the sense of this definition, I can find an abstract state machine which will simulate it step for step. In particular, uh, Alexey asked in my running example, the, the program in which, which languages was written, it was a little abstract state machine. Back to church. So the first paper was written, published in year 2000, and was there quite for a while. And then Nahum Dershowitz, who teaches at Tel Aviv University, visited me. And uh, it was him who was interested in proving Church's thesis. You know, he's in university. I'm in, in industry. I'm supposed to speak about practical things, not about such <laughs> proving theoretical theses. And um, as we discussed, we realized that this formalization of sequential algorithm is actually very helpful. So let us first recall what Church's thesis is. So we chose from the two versions, Church's and Turing, to work formally with Church's thesis because arithmetic, ch uh, Church's thesis is about in terms of arithmetic and um, uh, it's much more standard. What are the, what are the basic operation, arithmetical operations? It's much more standard thing than basic string operations. So that's the reminder of Gödel's statements. So th the only thing that was missing with abstract state machines was, hmm, let's see, people always say all, only. So what is the obvious problem with those three postulates? An abstract state machine or an algorithm, any algorithm satisfying those three postulates, compute functions which are not necessarily uh, computable. <laughs> For example, my running example, you deal with continuous functions. 
Now, continuous functions, no, some of them may be approximated, but in general, it's not something you can compute with. Now, there's no miracles I'd done by our algorithms or by abstract state machines. The miracles were built in in the initial state. So what is missing was to, to restrict the initial state properly. And our postulate says something like that, that only undeniably computable arithmetical operations are available in the initial state. Now, we don't say it in this form. You can say in the initial state you have you know, multiplication, addition, multiplication, uh, difference and division, and that's it. And zero. And so the algorithm satisfying all four postulates will be called arithmetical. And now from these four postulates, we can derive Church's thesis. Now, if this four postulate would be in terms of strings rather than arithmetic, then would be in a similar way we would be able to derive Turing's thesis. Or we can use Turing's additional proof and derive Turing's thesis from Church's thesis. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Yuri, for the excellent presentation. So uh, before we start the question, I wanted to acknowledge the uh, presence of uh, uh, respected uh, guests. And we're honor honored to have people from uh, other Silicon Valley companies, including the Leland Stanford Junior University and Yahoo. And so if you have any question, you have the first shot. <laughs> uh, Saul? No, OK. I have a question. Uh, okay. So in I, I, you didn't actually say theorem when you were uh, concluding those last couple of slides, but um, how long are the proofs? Um, yes, it says theorem. Yes, uh, but you uh, didn't. So this is your theorem, or? Uh, yes, this, okay. this is Dershowitz Gurevich theorem. Yeah, OK. And uh, how long are the proofs? Uh, the proof had some little sophistication, take some, some model theory. It's not particularly deep. The paper is very long because it is a very classical subject. And one of us, not me, <laughs> is very, very scholarly. So that paper uh, cites so many articles and books that probably, probably more than in, in the rest of my papers. <laughs> and Nahum has the incredible gift. I think he read them all. Mm. Or maybe some of them he skimmed, but uh, uh, got the necessary information. So the paper is, you know, as in foundations, you argue and argue subtle points. Now, the, the pure mathematical proof is in the first part in those three proving um, in this representation theorem. Let me come back. So the sort of the meat of the, of the proof is this representation theorem. Okay, and how long, I mean, how hard is that to prove? That is to say, is it one page, 10 pages? Four, five pages. Four or five, okay. And then theorems one and two, are they interreducible or do you have to prove them separately? Uh, you can prove them, you can reduce them one to another. Ah, okay, so you really only have to prove one, and then how long is the reduction from one to the other? Huh. <laughs> that depends. In in in, in 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 early times, each such equivalence, you know, was almost a PhD. Uh -huh. Today, it's all becomes, you know, for those. Let me see. For those of you who know, you know, sigma zero, you know, if if consider arithmetic. Uh, all Turing machine, all this, all these models, really formulated, uh, um, uh, really existential statements in arithmetic in pretty obvious way. So with, with the de development of logic, the equivalence between all these models become, became trivial. Okay. Well, that's so much for my complexity question. <laughs> Proof complexity. <laughs> right. right. So uh, any other questions? Sure. 
So you started by saying that uh, you can't prove Church's thesis because it starts with an informal notion and you can only prove equivalence of mathematical notions. So you say here you've proved Church's thesis, but what you've proved is the equivalence of Oops. two mathematical notions, algorithms that proceed by abstract state machines and algorithms in the sense of Gödel's recursion calculus. Okay. So the question is how convincing the postulates are that determine abstract state machines as, as an explication of the informal concept of computability. Okay. So, first of all, this is the true theorem, because the notion of the notion of algorithm here is the one which for, for which we gave a definition. So an algorithm is any entity satisfying three postulates. Now, how convincing are those four postulates? Um, so the first three, I think nobody argues with the first one. <laughs> nobody argues with one, with number one. Uh, in fact, many logicians argued with me, but I don't know. Not a, there is no any single paper where somebody, <laughs> somebody found it unconvincing and argued that it's not convincing. It sounds convincing to me, <laughs> but, it, but it, of course it is uh, a matter of uh, um, challenging. They have not been sufficient challenged, and I would love them to be challenged. But in fact, I think this, this idea that states are first order structures, uh, it's getting, uh, getting acceptance. So in, certainly in our group, where, uh, where abstract state machines are popular, people think in these terms. And, and um, there is uh, abstract, AS, abstract state machines are ASMs. So there is an ASM community. There is an ASM uh, annual conference. And there is an international community. And there is people try to formalize all kind of algorithms, not only sequential. Um, because there are extensions of these postulates to uh, parallel and, and other algorithms. And um, uh, they have been succeeding. There was not a single case that we came across an algorithm, and we cannot formalize it in, as an abstract state machine. But this is not a religion, as I said. They, they are there on the table to be challenged and to be argued against. Are you familiar with the um, with the uh, Douglas Hofstadter's reformulation of the CT thesis? Double. Something you said made me think of it. I didn't. Sorry, I didn't Can get you the repeat the question. Yes, I say, are you familiar with Douglas Hofstadter's reformulation of the CT thesis? Oh yes. Which is yes, yes, yes. It's it's not sufficiently formal for us to. Of course, but it relates an informal notion to an informal notion, which is why I like it. Um, <laughs> mathematics can only be done by, by uh, uh, mathematics problems can only be solved by doing mathematics. Um, that's his thesis. Yes, Math that's his version of the CT thesis, uh -huh. the church Turing thesis. <laughs> well, when, when you uh, mentioned the, when, it when reminds you mentioned the the. Go ahead. That kind of thesis reminds me of some uh, high-level specification, software specifications, which look more poetic than mathematical. <laughs> yeah. When you spoke of it being very fortunate that um, that uh, first-order logic is not uh, first-order logic is not um, uh, is not mechanizable, it's it's fortunate for mathematicians because they means they always have a job. True. <laughs> Agreed. I wanted to ask a very short question, if I may. So there was a large body of work related to, I think it was called comparative schematology in the 70s, like uh, uh, the works by Patterson and Hute and some other people, basically also defining computation in the 
you can say in the abstract algebraic models first order. So how how does it relate to the abstract state machines? Huh. At the time, I was a pure mathematician and paid zero attention to them. When I came to computer science, it was an ancient history, so I don't know that well. But from what I remember, it would be an abs abstract. State machine. Say it again. It would be abstract state and machine. <laughs> yes, yes, much much more specialized, I would say, as far as I remember. Mm -hmm. Uh, unless there are any other? Any critical, critical, oh, crit critical. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Uh, so is, uh, do you regard abstract state machines as a topic in its own right um, within computer science? Yes. Uh, so does it have uh, fundamental theorems and does it have open problems? Uh, this is, I would say it's not a mathematical issue. It is uh, more um, specification methodology for high level specification models based testing so it um, so there's no guidance from mathematics within the subject you take your draw your mathematics from outside the subject um, let me see let, let me say care <laughs> a little bit more carefully consider computer science it uses a lot of mathematics and mathematics, and there are a lot of theorems proved within computer science. And yet computer science is not mathematics. So it was a similar picture. So most people who work with abstract state machines just use them. There are few theorists who prove theorems. And there are a lot of theorems to be proven. So let, let, let me give you an example. If you're interested in polynomial time, Turing machines are just fine. You know, polynomial time in Turing machines is as, as, as good as polynomial time on random access machines or whatever. However, imagine you're interested in linear time. Now we have, th now things split. You know, Turing linear time is very, very modest. You know, random access machine is much richer. Now, if you go to computational geometry, they have yet, in, yet other uh, linear time model. So in abstract state machines, you may have linear time with a parameter. And the parameter will give all these models and more. So there, there are theoretical results like that. There are some initial beginnings to develop uh, lower bounds. So there's some mathematics done, but mostly applications. Well, I was thinking of, you know, uh, in computer science, we have uh, the equivalence of uh, in all these NP-complete problems as a, as, fundam as a fundamental part of computer science. And then we have, uh, as an open problem, uh, whether that's also the same as P. Uh, so is there anything uh, remotely like that uh, concerning AS ASMs? Yes, there was. Actually, there was a contribution of ASMs to that field. Yeah, let me. Is it okay if I continue a couple of minutes? Uh, okay, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Let me answer this question. So the standard notion of polynomial time is somewhat deficient. Why? And it's interesting that mathematicians find it quite useful and abstract. But in database theory, they discover that this notion is not sufficiently abstract. Why? Imagine you work with databases. Okay. Say, for simplicity, your database is a graph. Okay. Uh, graph, in, in graph, vertices are not linearly ordered. So expression like, take the first vertex, makes no sense. Okay. Now, graph algorithms typically use things like that. Take the first vertex such that. Now, initially, such queries were allowed, and then I would implement uh, a query algorithm in, on my machine, you know, send you the database, and you, you try in your implementation, and you get different results. So to ensure that kind of invariance, uh, SQL was developed, and before that, relational calculus. So, so 
when you take a, a database as an input, it is not a string. So inputs may have uh, symmetries. And the general form of, I, th I think the right form of uh, polynomial time is when the input is a structure. Okay. And currently the most versatile model for, uh, for that notion of polynomial time is SM-based. I think we're running out of time slightly. Right. But um, I wanted to uh, say thank you to Yuri again, and uh, also to the people who made this talk possible. <coughs> Pardon, it's uh, specifically to Amanda Ball and uh, Menk, uh, who is filming this for YouTube. So the video is going to be presently available. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>